Um, there were two communities, um, upstream and downstream. And as the name would suggest, they were connected by a stream. And the good citizens of downstream were um, uh, enjoying a, a wonderful summer. And all of a sudden, they began to find bodies in their stream. Some of them were, were already drowned, some were struggling, uh, some were um, trying to swim as, as hard as they could to the shore. Um, it was a real crisis. And the citizens of Downstream are, are wonderful, responsive people. And they developed all kinds of systems, all kind of, of rescue techniques. They um, developed triage, they got boats to get them in, they taught people how to uh, resuscitate, and, and they developed all good practices okay. and they took care of these people downstream and so uh, one night they were celebrating because they won civic awards for their response to these bodies in their stream and so they you can see the the up lights on the building and the fireworks going off and there's a grandfather and a little granddaughter walking next to the stream and the granddaughter asked the grandfather and said grandpa you're one of the patriarchs of this community and you seem so sad well, why aren't you happy? Why aren't you rejoicing? And the grandfather says, I keep asking one question. Nobody answers that. And the granddaughter goes, what's that question? And the, granddaughter, and the grandfather says, well, how did the bodies get in the river in the first place? You see, upstream, the bridge was out. And so um, one of the ways that I, I look at um, as a pastor and dealing with anxiety is it's very good to have all the practices we talked about. The here and now thinking, the worry cards, the snapping of the wrists, wrists um, uh, all of the techniques, uh, the exercise, and those are like the practices, but the truth is, the bridge is Jesus. And, and the bridge is out in a lot of our lives. If we look upstream and we recognize who this person of Christ is, not in a storybook, not as someone told me, but for themselves. That's the bridge, is, is Jesus. And so most of us want to spend a lot of time working downstream, and it's good and it's right. But I believe the real cause of the anxiety and the worry is, is upstream. Hi, my name is Colleen Swindall Thompson. I am the director of Reframing Ministries at Insight for Living, and it is my delight to have Steve Fisher today. Thank, Thank you, you for being here, Steve. My joy. We are talking on a subject that is touching almost everyone around the world, and that is anxiety. Most recently, a study that I read recently was on anxiety relating to 70% of doctor visits have at the core anxiety as the problem. Even if they are seeing a doctor for cardio issues, mm -hmm. for um, back pain, arthritis, or any other kind of physical challenge, usually the root goes to anxiety. And mm -hmm. Steve, I heard you knew a lot about this. Um, <laughs> personally, I, I know an awful lot about it. As you said, I'm, I'm one of those statistics. So um, maybe the best way to start, Colleen, is to try and gain an understanding of, uh, of the purpose of anxiety. Um, I believe we were created and designed by God. And he doesn't make mistakes, he doesn't make errors, that his creation is indeed perfect. And so you wonder, um, Lord, wh why did you give me this response? Well, why is this thing called anxiety at uh, uh, almost an epidemic level um, for a good and, and uh, uh, benevolent God, what, what is the purpose of this? And, and the truth is, when you understand the physiology of anxiety, um, it makes sense. And, and so, uh, I believe God loved us so much that he built in us this um, warning system. And, and that's generally what anxiety is. Anxiety is like um, an emotional radar that goes out and it scans the horizon for anything that could be a threat, a danger. Uh, in fact, we are hardwired where we um, interpret signs of threat and warning and danger almost eight to 10 times more than we do joy, happiness, or sadness. So truly, we are hardwired to be able to find those things that will hurt us. 
And, and that is really a, a brilliant design. It's a, it's a protective mechanism. So um, our minds go out and we scan the horizon for people, places, and things that, that may be a threat. And those um, threats can be perceived or they can be real. Um, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, uh, in a moment. But if you've had family of origin issues or if you've had real threats, then what happens sometimes it goes out and it sees a circumstance that looks like something that one time hurt you. Mm -hmm. And you begin to respond in a, a physical fashion. So, so God built this ability to kind of think and see and if it finds threat or if it perceives threat, the mind, what happens is physiologically our bodies get ready for what's called the fight or flight response. And it's a brilliant design. Our, our heart rate goes up. Our blood pressure goes up. Um, blood gets shunted from um, areas of the body that um, aren't in need of it as much to vital organs. Uh, fat gets dumped in our bloodstream so we have usable energy. Our pupils dilate. Yeah meaning our body is ready, our heart rate starts beating more. Our body is ready to fight or it's ready to run and that's a brilliant survival technique. And that's what anxiety does and God built it and said, look, I'm gonna give you a system hmm. that will prepare you, that will protect you. Now, now here's the difficulty, is that that works really well when it is a physical threat where you really do have to fight or right. flee or right. run from some um, threat. But nowadays in our society, we aren't running from saber-toothed tigers. Mm -hmm. we, we aren't running most often from people that are trying to hurt us. We're running from um, the boss that is hard on me walking down the aisle. So my, my heart rate goes up. It, it sees the boss coming. It knows that the boss yells at me. So all of a sudden our body is prepared now to take action, but we're sitting in our cubicle. It's the same way when a, a wife is at home and, and there's been a domestic violent incident and, he, and she hears her husband's car in the driveway and automatically yep. her anxieties kick in. Here's the car, that's my husband, my husband hurts me. And so she's being prepared to take action. Mm -hmm. But the problem is she's just sitting, preparing dinner and not running or fleeing. She's sitting there and so so God has built this warning signal that prepares our body to do something the difficulty is is that many times now there isn't what we call a concomitant use for that I meaning you're just sitting in your cubicle you're sitting at home preparing dinner but yet it's preparing and so you you ask okay God that that that's a wonderful survival skill and, and it truly is and again, I know we'll speak about it a little bit more, but to, to kind of really say, lay the platform for what we'll talk about, I believe God says, look, I love you, Colleen, so much that I'm going to give you this system to help protect you. And that's going to help you survive. But Colleen, if you really, really want to thrive, if you really, really want to live, You've got to suspend your nature because that is the nature, the natural part God mm -hmm. gave us to mm -hmm. protect us. And God says, I want you to suspend your nature and I want you to trust and believe in your a supernatural, your super nature, meaning the anxiety response comes from the lower and mid part of our brain where we don't really even have to think about that. That threat comes in and all of a sudden our body is there. Isn't it part of the autonomic nervous and system? And it, it gets us absolutely prepared before mm -hmm. we even know about mm -hmm. it. That's the brilliant design. Mm -hmm. And so God says, look, I, I gave you this, but I love you so much. I want you to live. I want you to thrive. So we have to learn how to um, shut down, if you will, this perception of threat. And he said, I gave you a super nature, meaning the part of the brain the top part of the brain is what God gave us and didn't give the animals. And in that part of the brain is where we can, where we develop reason and where we develop insight and where we develop the ability to discern. So, so understand this. Um, uh, a woman is maybe in her second marriage. Her first marriage, she was in a domestic abuse problem. Okay. Car would come in, heart rate would go up, and bad things would happen. Um, she is remarried. 
And now the husband comes home, a wonderful man, loving man, supportive. Car pulls in the driveway. Her response goes up. But now if she's using what God has given her, she's able to say, wait a second. That was my first marriage. My husband, as he loves me, he cares for me meaning she's beginning to use the reasoning God said. And it comes from the, the verse in Scripture of Romans 12, too, by the renewing of our minds. And, and if you look at, at Scripture, God is constantly talking about um, take each thought captive, think on these things that are good and right. Um, the game of life is played between the ears. God built us that way. He designed us that way. So... Uh, long answer <laughs> to a short question, okay. but to understand that the anxiety is a result of my perception and the response is part of what God gave us to protect us, but then he says, look, there's another way. You can use what I gave you and you can help choose, is this something to worry about? Is this something to not worry about? Is this really a threat? Is this not a threat? And that's how we begin to treat and be, we begin to cope with anxiety. But from the platform, God has built us, help us aware to protect us. But he calls to us and says, um, if you really want to live, if you really want to enjoy life, um, trust me, bring me your worries, bring me your fears, think about it differently. And that's one of the ways that we begin to deal with um, anxiety uh, from a biblical standpoint. Well, <clears throat> my question is, mm -hmm. um, the, the habits that we develop mm -hmm. to protect us, which are automatic, as you just mm -hmm. said, it's mm -hmm. an inborn God-made system mm -hmm. that turns on automatically. In fact, because Jonathan has an anxiety disorder, we have uh -huh. a list of symptoms to you look bet. for. Everything from the whiteness around his mouth, the dilation of the yep. eyes, to the sweating, yep. the heart rate. Mm -hmm. That system, um, the PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. is also a habituated response. Mm -hmm. For him it is. Mm -hmm. And we are constantly trying to pull him back right. to a reality right. that is right. And that's very hard. Really hard. How can you equip us with tools to help one another in that situation. Yeah, um, now that we understand sort of the, the, the physiological nature and, and just the normal response, um, how do you, what you're asking, okay, how do I manage this? How do I begin to cope with this? And um, there's really five ways that, uh, five or six ways that, that are generally accepted that, that help us deal with that. And so I'll go ahead and talk uh, about each of those. Yeah. And, um, hopefully that'll help those who are listening to, to get some tools, some practical ways to, to deal with this reality. Well, um, it, because we are a fear-driven yeah. people, yeah. we hear on the news most of the negative. Yeah. We see things getting blown up and people getting killed yeah. and yeah. shot. And tragedy Tragic. is around us. So our nature is to fear. respond with fear. And the Lord says, commands. Right. Do not fear. Right. Do not be afraid. Right. That's really hard to do. So that's why right. I would love to right. hear these. Sure. So one of the first ways that, that we encourage people in dealing with anxiety is um, is, is what I call, and, and they're an alliteration of, of six Ps. And, and the first P is, is perspiration, meaning um, one of the, the benefits of, of physical activity hmm. is it teaches your body how to handle the chemicals that are being um, uh, delivered when you're in an anxious situation so that um, what we call the secondary disorders, mm -hmm. secondary pathology of anxiety, um, don't take a toll on your health. So if right. I exercise three times a week and every time I exercise, the same chemical process, my heart rate goes up, my blood pressure goes up, um, blood is shunted to the working muscles, and that's a good thing because mm -hmm. I'm actually doing something. Mm -hmm. And so it teaches us how to respond to those chemicals. Now, let's say I'm sitting in my cubicle at work and my boss comes down and I have that um, anxiety, that anxious response. And all, so the same system gets put into place, but now the body says, wait a second, I've been seeing that three times a week for the last 12 weeks. 
I don't need to respond as dramatically. So the heart rate doesn't go up, the blood pressure doesn't go up because the body becomes conditioned to seeing those chemicals versus if you aren't physically active, every time you have that response, it takes a toll on the body. Yeah, in yeah. fact, the homocysteine level goes up, yeah. the yeah. cortisol level goes yeah. up. Those are all very Everything. debilitating yeah. after yep. Yep. a long period of time. Right. So, so you're saying exercise yeah. um, patterns the brain Correct. to respond Absolutely. differently, Absolutely. even if you don't have a treadmill in your office. Absolutely. Physical activity teaches us how to use these chemicals hmm. in a way that is not as destructive uh, to our bodies, if we're presented with that anxiety situation all the time, our body is a beautifully um, adaptive and reactive organism. It learns, and God's design is perfect. Um, one of the other benefits of exercise is that it, it does produce those catecholamines. Yes. It yes. does produce those endorphins. It does produce those things that give us a sense of, of well-being, yes. of peace. And so God designed us to move. Our, most of our life uh, is sedentary. So, yeah. so again, if we work within the design of God, things are usually good. If we work outside of the design of God, things usually break <laughs> down. Doesn't go so well. That's right. So, <laughs> he usually has a good plan. <laughs> so, so, so one of the one of the realities is we were built to move, and the same chemicals that occur <clears throat> in a perceived threat or an anxious situation are the same chemicals that occur in a real threat. It's just when you learn and your body knows how to use those, they don't become as destructive. And so one of the tools in dealing with anxiety is to be on a, in a regular exercise program. The calming effects are incredible, and the way the body responds is just brilliant. Now, even with, with my son, we bought a punching bag uh -huh. because it just helped him get some of that. Absolutely. That that yeah. extra energy, right. The, right. the anger part, uh -huh. out, and it would calm him afterwards right. while he'd be so tired. Right. You right. know, which was wonderful. Right. So I'm like, right. that'll calm you down. Okay, right. so what's the next one? Well, another one um, that I, I tend to call, it's um, perspective. So the second P is perspective. Okay, so now we're all in my category of reframing. So I love that. <laughs> that, that that's right. <laughs> I, I knew that. And so um, anxiety is predominantly based upon, again, protecting us a with this response. Okay. Well, and, and it could be real, but it, it, it most often is perceived. Again, it's that radar that goes out and it's trying to protect us. So anxiety is always lived in the future. Anxiety is, is something that is lived in the future. So your brain is out there going, this person can hurt me, even though in the here and now, there is no hurt. There is no pain. So if I have this um, uh, uh, anxiety trigger or triggers, my body is and my mind is saying these things can hurt me. And even though it hasn't happened yet, my body responds immediately now. So I could be sitting in work wondering, is my husband going to be home tonight? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to focus at work. And my thoughts are, in the future, is my husband going to be home? And if my husband is going to be home, am I going to be hurt? Is it going to be a war at home? And so you're sitting at your desk and your body's responding. Right. And it's about that sense in the future. And so an important tool in dealing with anxiety is really um, working on perspective. And one of the things that we talk about in perspective is learning how to live in the here and now. Okay. Um, there's, that, there's that saying that says if, if you're angry, you're living in the past, hmm. and if you're anxious, you're living in the future. Hmm. And our, our, our Lord Jesus is, is saying, I'm here. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm here right now. Um, uh, this may not be very uh, of a strong theological picture, but many times I see Jesus in, a, in, the, in the recliner is what... Mm -hmm. um, is, is, and, and, I've seen him in a yeah. lot of things, the recliner, so I, I, that's a first. I picture Jesus in the recliner, and, and, this is, and Steve's running back and forth. He's, he's mad and he's angry, and I'm sort of run back to the past, or I'm, I'm worried and I'm frightened and I'm running into the future, and, and our, our, our precious Lord is sitting there going, Steve, I'm just going to wait till you slow down. I'm right here. Mm. I, I'm waiting for you. I'm here. So one of the tools in perspective is learning how to live in the here and now. And um, one of the tools that becomes important in dealing with perspective is a thing that we call countering. 
Okay. Countering. Um, most of us, when we are anxious, we have a monologue in our brain. Okay. Meaning there is one voice that is saying, this is going to be bad, this is going to be scary, and it, and it repeats, I'm going to get hurt, I should be it's frightened. It's like the hamster on the treadmill. Absolutely, and it keeps going and it keeps going. Um, what breaks my heart, and I came to Christ a little bit later in my life, and one of the beautiful things that I understood about my relationship with Christ is when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, um, what came to dwell in me is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Mm. So I am um, uh, indwelt with um, this beautiful, loving spirit. And as a believer, I don't have to live with just a monologue. I have a dialogue. I have another voice mm. that speaks to me. Mm. And so as, as I'm running back and forth and I'm uh, that one thought is perseverating in my mind, mm -hmm. this is going to be bad, this is going to be bad, and I'm, I'm starting to build scenarios in, in my anxiety and my body, and everything's I mean, it rolling. Take it, flight. It, it takes flight, and it just runs, and we connect dots so quickly, we make pictures, and pretty soon we are sitting at a coffee um, uh, at Starbucks, and, and my heart's beating, and I'm nervous, and I'm afraid, and I can't concentrate, and it's because that one voice. And then there's that still small voice of the spirit that those who know Jesus should have. Mm -hmm. Say, Steve, calm down. Mm -hmm. I'm here. And so countering is allowing another voice that you as a believer have to speak truth. Mm -hmm. Because most of anxiety is predicated upon a lie. Mm -hmm. This is going to happen. And the stronger that lie and the more reality that has had in your life, and that's part of the post-traumatic where there is a real pain that has hurt, so your body's always looking for what is pain that looks like that so I don't get hurt again. And so we have this one voice, and the Spirit says, Steve, I'm with you. I'm okay. You're going to be okay. And so the ability to have perspective in the here and now is to be able to invite and allow that Holy Spirit to speak in. Steve, I'm with you. I have promised to never leave you. I promise to never forsake you. Steve, I didn't lead you into this wilderness for you to perish. Steve, I'm with you. Trust me. And so perspective is allowed best happen when we allow that, that indwelling of the Holy Spirit to have a voice in our, in our mind. You know, most recently, um, in dealing with some things in our own lives, John 10.10 10 talks about the enemy comes in to steal, kill, and destroy, right. but my sheep know my voice. And there's, there's a need for us as believers to know his voice. Absolutely right. And the only way we can know it right. is by reading. In fact, I had a piece of paper that I brought, but it may not. Here it is. Okay, so the other day, mm -hmm. for example, there was a situation that John was talking to me about and that anxiety started to grow. And I thought, what am I gonna do? I've mm -hmm. got to know the Savior's voice. So I opened up to, I'm like, I gotta get into the word, mm -hmm. opened up to Titus, read the, or Timothy. Mm -hmm. Can't really remember exactly That's which one right. it was. It was Timothy <laughs> all, or Titus. All word is good, <laughs> all word is good. And, mm -hmm. he, and it says, hope is based on the faith and the knowledge mm -hmm. of truth. Mm -hmm. And that to know our identity and purpose, mm -hmm. it comes from him, which we have to know his voice in order to know what our purpose Absolutely. is, what will bring us peace, mm -hmm. what will calm us down. Mm -hmm. The difficulty then, Steve, is for someone like my son who's disabled mm -hmm. has repeated offenses. Mm -hmm. One he just sp spoke with me about this morning, mm -hmm. which wasn't enormous, something you or, you or I could blow right, off. Right. To him, it was overwhelming. Sure, sure, sure. How do we as believers sure. um, help and live with yeah. those who have been so deeply wounded yeah, yeah. with that? Uh, again, part of it is, is to remind him, in your case with, with uh, young Jonathan, and in all parents in those circumstances, is to remind them of truth. Is to remind them. <laughs> I did. <didn't> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> is to remind him you're okay. 
okay. it's going to be okay. Meaning that um, our job as parents never ends. Our, our job as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're meant to encourage, we're meant to remind, we're meant to be as a living witness. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan, if he needs to hear that um, over and over again, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And to reassure him, Jonathan, you're okay. Nothing's gonna hurt you. I'm with you, Jonathan. God still loves you, you're forgiven. Whatever the words are, mm -hmm. it's the ability, and that's one of the beautiful things of being in community, of, uh, of knowing God, is that we are called as believers to encourage, to reassure, and as a parent to a child, that's the most precious spot to be, to encourage our child, to remind them of the truth. Because again, most of our fears, most of anxieties are built upon a lie. And, and what the enemy does is he tries to distort, he tries to distract, he tries to um, ultimately destroy us. Mm. And what we have, that countering, is to be able to counter the truth, or excuse me, a lie with the truth. Mm. Uh, the devil says you'll never be forgiven, you're going to get in <clears throat> great trouble. Uh, the Holy Spirit says you are forgiven, your debt has been paid, I am with you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, mm. you are lovable. Um, those are the things that begin to calm an anxious spirit, mm. a, a, the sweet, true voice of Scripture. And sometimes it's read, um, uh, we can read it from the Word, sometimes we hear it in a song. That's where music is so beautiful, where we can hear a song, and, and that song calms our heart because that song, that hymn is built upon the truth of Scripture. And so there's that calming. Sometimes it's a, it's a parent. Sometimes it's a friend. Um, we aren't built to live in isolation. We aren't built to live alone. And one of the reasons is, is because I believe we, are, uh, we need to encourage. We need to love. We need to speak in truth to our, 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 our brothers and sisters, our children, our parents, to remind them God's in charge. It's interesting, a couple days ago, I was speaking with a friend, and uh, the friend was in therapy for PTSD, mm -hmm. and the therapist said, because this is part of physiology as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he said, when you're living in the past or the future and you need to return to the now, mm -hmm. stop and pick out every color you see and say it out loud. Sure, sure. Or another tool was, um, put your hand in ice. Yeah. That'll wake you up, and mm -hmm. even move. Sure. Jump up and say yep. stop, and yep. the brain almost does a reset. Right, and and that's that's really one of the third things. So we have um, uh, perspiration, we have perspective, okay. the here and the now, and then we have what we call practices. Okay. And practices are exactly what you're just saying. Another one is. Um, uh, those wristbands that are popular now mm -hmm. uh, have been popular for a while. Uh, the WWJD type bands. All right. uh, you'll see a lot of people <laughs> has you know, an armband carrying those. <laughs> and, and, and one of the techniques, one of the practices would be to snap that band. So you're worrying, you snap the band. Um, all of those, those resets, as you huh. call those reboots, are to stop. Remember I talked about that thinking, that monologue yes. thinking? What it does is it interrupts um, that type of thinking with enough, w wait a second, there is another way to think. God is sovereign. God didn't leave me alone. Or I don't have to worry about that now. Or this isn't happening now. So the practices of dealing with anxiety involve typically breaking that monologue, breaking mm -hmm. that obsessive thinking that begins to sort of wear that mind down and wear your resistance down. And so um, snapping, putting your hand in water, picking out a color, um, standing up and moving. Yes. Another one is a practice we have is uh, I'll have people and now in this electronic age, it's a lot easier, <clears throat> but um, they create um, uh, worry times. And what they do is they carry a yeah. card. Okay. And every time I, I, I wonder how I'm gonna pay my mortgage and it's, I'm supposed to be working and, and attending. So you write that on a card and you give yourself, okay, from six to 6.30 tonight, I'm gonna worry. And you take out all those cards and you just worry the fire out of it, you know, <laughs> at that point. And, and you say, okay, this is it and then Done. So you discipline yourself. Absolutely. Where you give worry its space, but you create, you become, um, uh, you allow yourself to be in control of it instead of it being in control of you. And, and there are several people that I talk, and one of the beautiful things of our cross, God says, lay your burdens at my feet. Hmm. And there are people who have a Bible, um, a special Bible, and they will put it on a table, and at the end of the day, they will lay these worry cards at, 
at the foot of the Bible and say, Lord, I couldn't handle these today. These are yours. Oh. And, it, and it provides a, a practice, uh -huh. a behavior that allows them to realize, um, Jesus, you, 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 you didn't build me to carry these. Hmm. Um, I can't handle this. Um, I am not capable of carrying that burden, but you are. And so even in Jonathan's case, you could, you know, say, okay, Jonathan, every time you worry or feel anxious, I want you to um, maybe it's uh, take a, a handful of blue marbles and I want you to put, you know, um, one marble from one pocket and put it in another. At the end of the night, I want you to put all the marbles in the bowl and say, Jesus, I give you my worry. Huh. I give you my fear. And you begin to develop practices that do two things. One, interrupt. Yes. And two, place to the only one that I know is capable of handling my worry and my anxiety, and, that, and, that's, and that's our Lord. So those are some of the practices of dealing with anxiety, interrupting many different ways to do it, love the creative ways, and placing those um, burdens. Okay. Um, and again, uh, they're, they're real. They may not be real, but they're real to the person experiencing them. So to um, dishonor them um, is just that, it's dishonoring them. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's so important as a body to, to validate and to empathize and to yeah. say, that is terrifying. Yeah. I understand yeah. and right. that would be so fearful. Right. So let's do something with that. Right. Like I have a worry card list for John, or yeah. a, a verse list that sure. he can carry with him. You bet. And he's able to then pull those out, and um, another one is where his strength comes from. Mm -hmm. The Lord has given me strength. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my peace. Whether he can connect those dots right. cognitively right. is not something I can choose to decide. Correct. It's just something that, it's a tool for him. Absolutely. Okay, so I have a question about sure. this. We also know in scripture that Paul talks a lot about I went through this, I went through that, mm -hmm. I went through this, that we are promised that we are going to suffer, that mm -hmm. we are promised life is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the person who says, I'm practicing those things, I am doing that mental reset, I am in the word, and yet this does continue. Um, the, the worry still continues is, is, is what yes. you're saying. Yeah. Or, like with my son's case, mm -hmm. there are some bullying issues that we constantly have to address. Yeah. Yeah. And I entrust him to the Lord. Right. And I want the Lord to stop him. <laughs> and when he doesn't, yeah. I'm like, hang yeah. on. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. I, I mean, again, into this life, there will be troubles. I mean, yes. I have a saying, again, that, that heaven's heaven and this ain't heaven. Yeah. Um, meaning they're we You're not kidding. <laughs> How about that for a profound <laughs> yeah. statement on, on a Jesus Friday morning, the right? Jesus and this ain't heaven. Right, and this is in heaven. And, and, and the truth behind that is, um, is, is again, um, uh, to recognize um, that something your, your father speaks about often, that, that, that the suffering in our life is an opportunity to, um, uh, uh, to be molded, uh, yeah. to be conformed. Yeah. Uh, to his image, mm -hmm. and um, this is the way he has chosen. Mm -hmm. um, that the suffering path um, is a way uh, in which we are molded uh, to his image, and, and that's an ultimate dependence. And um, one of my favorite pieces of scripture is, is in Romans 5 <coughs> 3, uh, just paraphrasing it says, I When trouble that. comes, we're to persevere, and out of perseverance comes character, and out of character comes hope. Mm -hmm. The truth is, when trouble comes, when worry, anxiety, suffering comes, we want to go right from the trial, right to the hope. And God says, no, no, no. <laughs> it's about persevering. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and it's out of that perseverance is where the character, and that is the character of Christ. And it's the character of Christ is where that hope comes from. Mm -hmm. By and large, we stink at persevering. In, we want relief. Yeah, and, and that's what the body of Christ is. That's what being in the Word, that's what listening to um, uh, uh, true um, uh, biblical music that soothes the soul, uh -huh. all of those are designed, being in community, are designed to help us persevere, uh -huh. to recognize this is difficult, but I didn't leave you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, He didn't leave us alone, but, but I want you to persevere. Uh -huh. um, I want you to keep going. And so... 
you know, the ability to understand that is, is, a, is a great help to that anxiety. This will be difficult. That's not fatalistic. That's embracing the reality and then realizing, but God, you didn't leave me alone. <clears throat> There's not a perseverance app. Yeah, the, boy, boy, would but that you know what there be is? Was, yeah. Another tool is to set your timer. And, yeah. and you can do and, that. And, and you give yourself a worry from this time, a worry from that time. Yes. Exactly. Or and a mental reset. You absolutely. know, every two hours, I'm going to do this mental sure. reset. Sure, sure. And it's um, you know, one of the things that, from that, that perspective standpoint, again, uh, to go back to, to that P, there's, there's something we call um, microscopes and telescopes. And, and I think it helps us uh, with a very practical tool in how we deal with the anxiety, the, the fear of the unknown. Mm. And it's, and it's uh, being able to use the right instrument at looking at the circumstance that you have, for example, um, if I am feeling overwhelmed okay. and, and life is big and I don't know if I'm ever going to get work, I don't know if I'll get married, I don't know if I'll have kids, oh I don't gosh, know, you know, pick, tumble. yeah, you pick. And so life is really big and you're looking at life out of a, out of a telescope. Okay. Um, the idea then is to change the tool, the instrument. Now use a microscope and say, okay, but Lord, all I can handle is right now and all I have to do and you and I have spoke about this before is do the next right thing yes. and so so when you find yourself overwhelmed by anxiety that you don't know you've got to change tools you're looking at your life with a with a mic with a telescope and God says no no I just want you for this next moment can you can you make it through this next moment mm. can you take a deep breath because that helps in dealing with anxiety can you realize what am I thinking um, well that's not true I just have to do this next right thing, and that may be get out of bed, that may be wash the dishes, that mm -hmm. may be call a friend, that may be whatever it is, but the ability to deal with anxiety is to be using the right tool. And the opposite works true. So if I am so afraid of, um, let's say, this interview, <laughs> distinct possibility, <laughs> I, I get anxious, You're and it's, it, it's, it's ironic to, to have them uh, talking so about terrifying. anxiety, and, 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 and this is as unsettling as it could be. But um, all I, so I'm focused on this one event. I'm using a microscope to look at this one event. Now God is saying, no, no, use a, use a telescope. Realize I am big. I am sovereign. I am in charge. I have gone through this, Steve. I am with you. Mm -hmm. And there's a peace that comes over that anxiety. So if you're overwhelmed, just do the next right thing. If the next right thing has got you so locked up and so worried, remember that God is sovereign. He's okay. big. Okay, so the telescope is, is focusing on the on sovereignty, the sovereignty of, of God. That even if this interview tanks, Colleen, <laughs> and, and, and I say nothing of redemptive <laughs> value, um, I know it's going to be okay. I was just listening yeah. to John Piper yeah. on the way over here on Hope. Yeah. And he talked about a family in his church that had been um, killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it made no sense. Mm -hmm. And he said, if I didn't believe in the sovereignty of God, right. I would not have any hope. Yeah. But because I do, yeah. I know that there will be a reason right. and a purpose in it. He also yeah. said something interesting. Not to always look for the purpose in it right away. Uh, completely. We're so quick to jump oh, to that. Absolutely. I don't know about in your life, but but God has always made more sense to me in the rearview mirror. <laughs> always. Like, oh, yeah. I get it. Now okay. I now, get it. Now, now I get that. And we forget it. And that's where we trust in that moment where we say, you know, I'm running back and forth. Remember, I'm mad about the past. I'm worried about the future. And Jesus is saying, I'm here now. So, Lord, I trust this moment for you. I, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm sitting at your feet. Calm me. Remind me, absolutely, okay. just to say I'm here. And when, again, here is really uh, <clears throat> overwhelming, I'm able to look and say, but God, you're in charge, the big picture. You, 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 you have my life in your hands. Why should I worry? You've been back. I've seen where you've come through. I've seen how I thought it was over, and you have shown up. You have been present. Again, that's why... Um, you know, practices such as journaling are really important or talking to a friend, you know, are really, really important. Um, uh, so uh, you and I are friends and if you're going through a particular time and you can't, oh, I'm, it's never going to get better. I can go, Colleen, remember two years ago when you were worried and God showed up? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about a relationship, a friendship, um, that we can remind each other of God's true presence that in the here and now we're not seeing. And uh, we look in the mirror and go, that's right. You have been faithful. Why would you not be faithful again? Now, it may look different than I thought it was going to look. Right, which is part of, I mean, this whole reframing, it it Uh is an examination of what we have believed to that point. And then it is, part of the steps are, you pull in other people. Sure. Because our perspective is not going to be the clearest. Sure, sure. And then you also can call them. Right. Right. And say, so, you know what? I am falling apart right now. Yeah, and, and, and that's that's the, the power of uh, of your blog or, or, or the power where someone could have a bad day and they can read and they can hear a story of someone else and they go, okay, okay, I, yes, I remember that. That's true. And the ability to encourage one another um, is is the true heart of that community. Yeah. And, and it takes so many different forms. Um, my greatest prayer before I come on, uh, came to sit with you today, would, um, if indeed this, this does make some type of error that someone in Massachusetts or Wyoming would get a glimpse and hear us talk and go, okay, I, that's right, I need to reframe this, I need to keep my perspective, remember that God is true, he's come through, I don't need to worry, I don't need to run in the past, I don't need to go in the future, I need to stop this thinking, I need to remember the Holy Spirit is there. Mm-hmm. And some of the things that we're talking about gives them just enough encouragement mm-hmm. to do that hard thing I talked about, and that is to persevere. Mm-hmm. And that is that to is persevere. Hard. That, that oh, can sure. be hard when there is repeated offenses or repeated sure. pains or repeated whatever sure. to truly right. be in the here and, then, and the now right. and to set our mind on what is right, right and true. Absolutely. Again, you know, um, as I mentioned, the, the God makes no um, sort of hidden truths behind that, that he, he challenges us to think. And remember, we started this talking about how, what God gave us is this higher level of our brain where we have reason, where we can think, where we can choose. I can either choose to live this way or God, you have given me the wisdom, the insight, so I can think differently. Again, we can't change the past, but we can learn how to think differently about the past. Interesting. Um, the, we can't change the past, but we can think differently about the past. We, we don't know what's happened about the future, but we can think about the future, saying, God, go with me. Yeah, I know that's about all we me. know, because we don't know what is promised. That, In fact, that's exactly right. a friend of mine said, forgiveness is giving up the right to have a better past. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. Isn't and, that incredible? And just laying that down and saying, okay, Lord, um, and, and it takes a, a great deal of humility. It takes a great deal of trust. It takes, uh, it's impossible to do alone. Uh-huh. Um, it, it requires um, that relationship because um, the monsters always go grow bigger in the dark. They so, do. so if we just are our, our own, um, again, that one voice inside of us, um, all of a sudden what was a worry becomes a panic attack because there's no one to speak truth. There's no reminder of truth. There's no reminder of hope. There's no reminder of encouragement. The things that Jesus says, this is what I'm here for. What should we not do? And I'll just, I'll just answer my own okay, question real quick. <laughs> Monologue. Mm-hmm. Um, like, well, don't worry about that. Uh, that just is so irritating. Yeah. Because it doesn't enter into yeah. um, where I'm at. Now, right. there's truth in not to worry, but let's, Let's talk about what we can do with what you're worried about. Right. That it, it, helps. Right, right. What doesn't help? Yeah. Um, well, what doesn't help is, is to, to give um, pithy, um, what amounts to condescending statements, get over it, forget about it. Yeah. Um, again, th- th- that... They want to. Yeah, and, and, and usually when people say that, it's, it's more about them than it is about you, <laughs> you know, hurting at that point. Huh. They just are tired of you talking. They're tired of you complaining. Um, again, I, I, I'm a believer in truth, mm-hmm. but to discount um, uh, people's feelings and emotions is um, a, a very 
I think, part of Satan's uh, arsenal at that point, to, um, to live in a world where your thoughts and feelings are discounted. And that's what I pray um, all our churches have, is they're filled with the body of Christ, that, that someone is there to hear, someone is there to listen um, with the advent of the Internet um, and what you're doing in the reframing ministries, mm -hmm. that someone is there, that, there's, that they aren't alone, um, so they don't have to just hear, forget about it, God won't give you more than you can handle. Well, yeah, well, he does, yeah. so we can call upon the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that, that, there's nowhere in Scripture that that, that, that is <laughs> I spoken know. through. I mean, it's all about him giving I, us more so he can bend our knee. It's and, kind of and offensive. Enter. Like, yeah. did I go to the cross yeah. for that? Right. The, the, those are, you know, so pithy, short, abrupt answers um, really don't help a great deal. Again, but there is truth. Sure. There, there is a challenge to say, okay, Colleen, this is what you're worried about. Now let's, what I call, play the tape forward. Mm. Let's, let's run this out. So you're worried about this. What if this doesn't happen? Or are you sure this is going to happen? Huh. And, and you come to that insight, and you come to that trusting place, and you bend your knee. Yeah. Um, those are the things that help um, discounting, minimizing, or, or, condescending. Um, saying, um, well, you think that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> you want to go, okay, yeah. one-upping, right. really. And, you know, in this day and age, sadly, sometimes we wear our stress as a badge of honor mm. that I've got more stress than you, so that that in inherently <laughs> I'm more important than you. And, and uh, the enemy has just jacked it up and mm. lifted it upside down to think that represents someone of importance because they are more stressed, they have more worry. Um, how sad is that? Yeah. Um, but that's what we do. We one-up each other. We discount each other. So those things that don't help are usually those things that minimize the okay. person. Because God created everyone fearfully and wonderfully made with yeah. a purpose and a reason and a design. So um, those become uh, discounted. <clears throat> I came across this responding to emotional crisis. And it says, when someone we know or love is having an experience of intense emotional suffering... It is hard to know what to do. It's mm -hmm. natural to feel overwhelmed and afraid. But a caring friend or family member may in fact be more, be more of support than a professional in times of emotional oh. overwhelm, overwhelming situations. To have a relationship with a person is so important and a natural form of support. Yeah. And they, they talk about the neurochemistry. Emotional crisis is often the first step to the process of releasing and reorganizing one's life. Sure. So when we are allowed to fall apart, that could be God's plan in the transforming process. Mm -hmm. Oh, a absolutely. God um, absolutely breaks down to build back up. It's that beautiful image of us um, on, the, on the potter's wheel where he shapes and he molds and he says, okay, Steve, this is what you're like. And I'm, a, I'm this vessel, and I get to be used, per, say, in one of my daughter's lives for this season. Then he goes, okay, crack. Now I'm going to reshape and reform you and remold you because now I, I need you to be this type of vessel for your family. Yes. How can the church become more um, comfortable? I know that to be comfortable with another suffering, you have to be comfortable with mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. How can we become more comfortable to embrace someone who's just messy? I hate yeah. falling apart, yeah. but yeah. the reality is, I do. Yeah, and, and I, I honestly think, Colleen, that the churches are uh, are getting better at that. I, I, okay. I really think that we are recognizing that um, uh, it is important to to enter into the messiness, and yeah. it's important to not um, be so um, uh, convicted. Yeah, d dismissive of that and. Mm -hmm. Um, I think churches are becoming more accepting of that, and, and I think there's ministries that are developed out of that, and, and people are just recognizing the fact that, you know, it, it's good and right to care. Usually, um, before things are cleaned up, they're a yeah, mess. Yeah, absolutely, and, you know, God works in that. I think we talked about this in one of other mm -hmm. things. There is um, uh, uh, no growth that doesn't happen without a, a breaking, um, I, I call it the law of the farm. Um, before a, f uh, a farm <clears throat> is planted, the ground must be tilled and it's broken up. Mm. It's destroyed. And in that destroy, then the farmer throws the seeds 
because now there's a receptive soil to take that seed. Mm -hmm. And then when it's loved and it's nurtured and it's cared for, um, by God's grace, it develops and it produces fruit. Mm -hmm. No farmer would throw seeds on an untilled ground. But it has to but be. It be has, but the tilling is breaking. And so mm -hmm. much of our, our trials and our suffering that is um, uh, the cause and the root of some of our anxiety, mm -hmm. it is God doing what God does in his two creations. He, he breaks the soil. He tills it, not mm -hmm. because he is punishing or destroying, because he is preparing. Mm -hmm. He's ready to plant those seeds. Um, in my case, it, it was uh, when my daughter passed away, he began to, it was a horrible breaking of my life and, and disruption of my life. But as I look back again, God makes sense in the mirror. Mm. Um, he was planting seeds that um, I'm doing my best to, to nurture and uh, uh, prayerfully harvest uh, the fruit. Mm. And so... Um, you wouldn't be who you are today yeah. without that. Yeah. But you don't want to go through it again. No, I, and again, I, I, um, I recognize that fact that, uh, that it's not about me, it's about what God does in my life. And so, um, you know, the, the, the final sort of P that, that, that I talk about, and we've alluded to it in several of the other ones, is, is this, um, so we have the perspiration, we have um, perspective. Uh, the perspective, and we have the practices. Um, we also have... Um, the uh, um, the prayer mm. uh, a, a vital a vital piece of that is mm. is prayer mm. uh, is is that absolute fact of recognizing um, that I I I, I can't carry this mm. I, I can't hold this um, that relationship um, uh, with God is is critical to, to be able to deal with my anxiety, to deal with my worry, to be able to say, Lord, help me. Mm -hmm. um, the Psalms of David, the uh, Psalms of Lamentation, mm -hmm. um, just this outpouring of my worry and my fear, my struggle and saying, God, take it. And, and, and that's not um, just church language. I mean, that's, that's real, soul. real fact. You know, there's studies done that those who are involved in prayer yes. um, reduce their cardio stresses, their blood pressure is lower, their heart rate is lower, their response to anxiety. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, physiological data that says um, uh, surrendering yourself and petitioning to, to God matters. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. And so one of the tools, as you talked about in dealing with anxiety, is to um, go into that uh, that quiet place and, and to unload um, your burdens, your cares, your worries, your troubles with God. That's just not nice poetic language that scripture talks about and it's fact, it's truth. And well, mo meditation so often is looked at as, you know, well, meditation, you know, can be put in a bad context. No, we are to, as Psalm 1 says, meditate yeah. on the word yeah. day and night. I would also, and I think we talked about this at one point with the whole, the wholeness of a person, mm -hmm. to look at our physiological structure. Am I absorbing the right vitamins? How am I taking vitamins? Am sure. I taking care of myself? One of the things we learned sure. about my son is, and for me is we don't absorb certain vitamins mm -hmm. that are anxiety reducing. Mm -hmm. So now we have a doctor who makes a special blend of that vitamin and what do you know? Yeah, God better. didn't didn't create us compartmentally. Create us in harmony, mm. and our 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 thoughts, our mind, our emotions, our our body, they all work in in beautiful in beautiful beautiful harmony. And mm. um, uh, you know, I have that that saying that in all of God's creation, uh, from His farthest star to His farthest planet, God has created no greater distance than that from a man's head. To his heart, I believe these 12 inches are as are, are as far as as God has ever created, and it's about the ability to take the truth in Scripture, the truth the Holy Spirit whispers, to know that, but then to bring it into our heart and to realize God's in charge. I can't believe you just said that because I wrote on that this very week. Did you really? I did, because I'm plodding along in life in some things yeah. and. Um, and the longest distance has mm -hmm. been from my head to my Amen. heart. Yep. It is 
sometimes exhausting. Yep, yep. And, and, and there's there's a beautiful process, and I, and I think it it's um, consistent with with our discussion here about anxiety is that um, we read scripture, we listen to scripture, yes. we understand scripture in order to inform our minds. Yes. That informing is designed to help conform our heart yes. to that. Uh, we have a heart of God and we recognize that he is indeed in charge but the conforming of our heart is designed to transform our feet mm -hmm. that we do different we live different we think different we act different so there's this beautiful process I believe that God has of informing to conform to transform and when we allow that river that 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 process to flow um, uh, we recognize that uh, we are at peace mm. and that um, we could be like Paul sitting in a Roman jail ready to get his head cut off and him basically saying, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> oh, oh, okay, uh, you know, if, if I okay. die, I come to with you, Jesus, and if not, then I guess I have more to do here. And I'm, I'm not being cavalier with that statement. I'm just he recognizing was he, he was, he knew who God was, his heart believed in God and therefore his behavior and his actions were at peace. It's when we have that incongruence where I don't know what I believe and therefore I can't really trust it and I'm surely not going to act that way. And maybe I know enough, but it hasn't quite reached my heart yet, so my feet can't do it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm just doing it, but I don't believe it for a minute. Okay. What we try and do in mental health, we call it congruence. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a matter and it, it's a beautiful biblical example of, of why we daily meditate. Um, why we daily read scripture and there are some days where I just read it and I don't know necessarily why I'm reading it but the best analogy is that to an athlete um, who practices let's say free throws day in and day out um, because when he gets in the game he wants to know he doesn't have to think he just wants to respond because he's been informed, his heart is conformed, and his body is transformed, he knows what's truth. So now when I get in an anxious situation, if I am indeed in the word, I'm talking to people, I'm listening, I'm praying, again, that anxiety is less because I know. I've seen it every day. And, and that's what perseverance is. Um, like in exercise, I exercise every day, my body doesn't respond as much. If I'm dealing and I'm living with Christ mm -hmm. every day, when that anxiety comes, it's like, okay, it's okay, I know who he is. It's that automatic response yeah. we started with. And, it, and God does a, you know, he's a very consistent God. Our God is not a God of one-offs and inconsistency. He is who he says he is. His design is what it is, and it always has been. And when we surrender and we just, okay, God, doesn't mean that life is going to turn out without the difficulties. It just means, as scripture says, I'm with you in those difficulties. Yes. You're not alone. I love the verse um, when Jesus was with Mary and Martha and they've lost their brother and they are so burdened and, and grieved. And they were like, where were you? And he wept with them. Yeah. He didn't go, well, how come you didn't just know I would help? He right. was just grieved. He experiences our grief. Right. And Isaiah talks about that sure. as well. I find so much comfort in that. Yeah, and, and, and so um, I want to share just a, an allegory, and I, I don't know where I, I heard it, and I, I've, I've used it for, for many years, and, and I think it becomes um, a good way to kind of frame, there's that word again, mm -hmm. frame, um, our discussion here on anxiety, uh, on anxiety and, and the allegory goes like this, an allegory is a story within mm -hmm. a story. And um, there were two communities, um, upstream and downstream. And as the name would suggest, they were connected by a stream. And the good citizens of downstream were um, uh, enjoying a, a wonderful summer. And all of a sudden they began to find bodies in their stream. Some of them were, were already drowned, some were struggling, uh, some were um, trying to swim as, as hard as they could to the shore. Um, it was a real crisis. And the citizens of downstream are, are wonderful, responsive people. And they developed all kinds of systems, all kind of, of rescue techniques. They um, developed triage, they got boats to get them in, they taught people how to uh, resuscitate. And 
and they developed all good practices okay. and they took care of these people downstream. And so uh, one night they were celebrating because they won civic awards for their response to these bodies in their stream. And so they, you can see the, the uplights on the building and the fireworks going off and there's a grandfather and a little granddaughter walking next to the stream and the granddaughter asked the grandfather and said, Grandpa, you're one of the patriarchs of this community and you seem so sad. Well, why aren't you happy? Why aren't you rejoicing? And the grandfather says, I keep asking one question. Nobody answers that. And the granddaughter goes, what's that question? And the, granddaughter, and the grandfather says, well, how did the bodies get in the river in the first place? You see, upstream, the bridge was out. And so um, one of the ways that I, I look at um, as a pastor and dealing with anxiety is it's very good to have all the practices we talked about. Right. The here and now thinking, the worry cards, the snapping of the uh -huh. wrists, wrists um, uh, all of the techniques, uh, the exercise, and those are like the practices. But the truth is, the bridge is Jesus. And, and the bridge is out in a lot of our lives. If we look upstream and we recognize who this person of Christ is, not in a storybook, not as someone told me, but for themselves, that's the bridge, is, is Jesus. And so most of us want to spend a lot of time working downstream, and it's good and it's right, but I believe the real cause of the anxiety and the worry is, is upstream. It's who is this Jesus to you? Will you behave as you believe? Is God sovereign? Is he in charge? Does Jesus care? Does he love me? Is he enough? That allows you then, no matter what happens downstream, if your bridge is up, and that bridge is Christ, you can handle. You aren't falling in the water and drowning and, and, and in bad shape. Again, nothing wrong with what's been done down, downstream. It's necessary and right. But I believe the true um, treatment for that anxiety is found upstream, and it's in that relationship of Christ. And so as a pastor, uh, again, I want to I wanna look at people's bridges. Are they out? And we gotta help build that bridge. And a lot of people um, know Christ, but it's about what we're talking about, moving what I know right into my heart. So I believe in Christ. Believe in him. Yeah. We can say we believe, but then do we believe? And that's where worry and anxiety, it's about things that have not yet happened that are stealing all of the joy today over something that has not yet happened in the future. Again. God designed us, said, this is the way your mind's going to think. And it's a good thing because if you don't know me, at least you'll have some protection. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you how to really live. Put that away. Don't and watch put me that there. away and, and reach me. Supernatural. Mm -hmm. Supernatural. Use your brain. Choose me. Realize what I've said in my word. That's your best defense against the worry and the anxiety of the future is to understand it's about the bridge upstream and the truth uh, of, of what he says. I don't know why you were ever worried about this. Oh, thing. my heavens. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have watched this and you don't know the Lord, Steve, your pastor's heart has come through. Good. Once again, uh, we wanna invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, Connecting with Steve at Stonebriar Com mm -hmm. Community Church. Connecting with me at Insight for Living. Please reach out and please connect with us because we want you to have a strong bridge so you can live in peace and enjoy each moment. Amen.